Good evening. It is now seven o'clock. I would like to call the Rockdale County Board of Education regular session to order. Would you please stand as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag? Pledge of Allegiance of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented? For the consent, I want to pull the budget out of the consent agenda. Right. Sandra Jackson Lett has requested to pull the budget out of the consent agenda. Do I have any questions? Don't vote for it. Okay. All right. So, um, with the consent agenda pulled, can I get a motion to approve the agenda as presented, please? Okay. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. Do we have any visitors? We do. Ms. Annette Bryant, come forward. Welcome. For Rockdale County High School, the football club, and see if we could get it approved. I don't know what's approved or not, but we want to live stream the games. And um, since we're a technology school, I think it would be simple. So the person that was supposed to meet me, she knew all about it, but um, she didn't come. But I think some of it's free, some of it's not, but probably a lot of people have some experience in that. But I was hoping that someone at the county could. Um, Organized with the sports team. I know there's something with um, you know, the um, other high school, the technology that they can do something to live stream these kids. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that to us. Um, Thank you. So we will certainly have someone to follow up with you okay. and let you know um, what that plan is and how what that looks like. Okay. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I would like to turn it over to Dr. Oates for cabinet update. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, our distinguished vice chair, our board members, executive cabinet, senior cabinet members, and our attendees. Uh, I uh, We have a, a few items uh, for presentation this evening that I think will be very insightful. Uh, point of personal privilege, I would like not to change the substance of the agenda, but the order. Uh, it was such that we would lead with Ms. Tanya Cobb, uh, presenting on our scholarship update, uh, Derek and Michael, if that's possible. Okay, thank you so much. And then we'll fall back to Dr. Richardson and conclude with our financial report. Dr. Vice Chair Duncan, Dr. Oates, and distinguished board members. This evening, I am pleased to present the district profile of the senior class. So what we have here is preliminary scholarship award amounts, and they're preliminary until the HOPE um, profile will be finalized, which is going to be um, June 30th of this year. So what you see is our overall scholarship amount is $37,196,968. That's our overall scholarship amount for the class of 2024. As you can see, they're broken down by high schools as well. Um, with Magnet pulled out from Rockdale High School. Um, we looked at our HOPE dollars and then our general scholarship dollars, and this is inclusive of students that receive fine arts scholarships, athletic scholarships, and merit scholarships. Um, total dollar amount with Magnet having the highest with 15 million. 
Um, I'm going to break down and look and do a comparison of last year to this year. So last year, as you can see, our hope dollar amount, I'm just going to back up so I can see the screen just a little bit. Okay, so our hope dollar amounts last year, we did increase um, slightly. Uh, we, um, I want to look right here. So Wizell Miller, I'm going to go back to the other, but Wizell Miller, as you can see, we um, have just a few Zell Miller scholars. And the reason for that is because with Zell Miller, you have to take the SAT and ACT. And this year we had fewer students taking the SAT and ACT because it was optional for test admission. Ms. Cobb, if I might, I apologize for the introduction. Grab the mic and hold it okay. so that you, oh, it can be carried on our live stream. Thank you. As you can see, um, we have fewer Zell Miller scholars than we've had in previous years. And now the next slide will show you that. The number of HOPE scholars, um, we did increase. Um, this is something that we definitely need to work on um, overall as a district. For HOPE Scholar, it has changed. It's not just having the 3.0. The students have to have a certain amount of rigor courses, which all of our students have the rigor courses just based on the classes that they're going to take overall. So we ensure that our students graduate and have the total number of rigor courses. However, the Zell Scholarship the students have to have an SAT or a specific ACT score, which is the 20 is which is a 25 ACT or a 1200, and it is in one city. This year we saw a decline in the number of students who were taking the SAT or ACT because it was optional for college admission. However, this the for next school year. Schools are going back to you have to have the SAT and ACT. And so we're going to make that push for our students to take the test. We are offering the SAT and ACT at um, on our campuses for every administration. Now, our comparison for 22-23 school year versus 23-24, as you can see, the number of HOPE scholars that we had each school year. They have um, increased except for that at Salem High School. And again, that is, we need more um, push in terms of academic advisement, and we have to have someone additional looking at the students. Last year, we had college and career, not the 22-23 school year, we had college and career advisors. This current school year, we did not. We just had the um, the um, school counselors, and again, you can see the number of Zell Miller. ASVAP data is something now that is we must submit for CCR for CCRPI, and we have offered the ASVAP at each of the schools, and these are great numbers just for offering the ASVAP. So this is something we're going to continue to do. So we had about 100 students take the ASVAP in our district. So these are great numbers for us. If you look at the day in the life of a high school counselor, what we're doing every day, um, we're writing letters of recommendation. We have classroom guidance, SEL, um, suicidal ideation, dealing with trauma. We have the mandated school lessons that have to be done per the state. We're handling bridge bill, preparation for PSAT transition. There's also the ASVAP, academic advisement, scheduling students, as well as um, dealing with career day. Every school in the district now per district, they must have a career day for the students. So there's a lot going on. Um, but we were still able to get our students to $37 million in scholarships. What, how did we do it? So these are all district initiatives that in terms of how we got to the 37 million. This year, we invited the president and um, the admissions team from South Carolina State University. When they came with their team, we were able to um, receive over um, 
it was a, around $103,000 in scholarships for students. Also, our students attended the Infinite College Scholarship Fair at New Birth where students received over a million and two, $1.2 million in scholarships. We hosted a scholarship and financial aid night here at the district, which um, we did for ninth through 12th grade, which was something that was a first for us. And we were able to enlighten parents and students on scholarship opportunities. We hosted a probe college fair, which was the first that we've ever done that. We had over 79 colleges here on our campus, both at Rockdale High School and at Salem, and the students were bussed over. Students received college fee waivers and on the spot scholarships for college. We're doing that again this year. We partnered with the Common Black College application um, at no cost to the district where our students were able to receive free college waivers to apply to 65 HBCUs with one college application. Based on that, students were able to receive scholarships from those schools. Um, we worked collaboratively with Cindy Ball's team for our website to push out scholarships and also the remind notifications when scholarships were due. High school counselors were asked to work um, over the summer, so they're working now in order to get this um, to do a review of all transcripts to make sure that students have rigor courses on their transcripts. Um, we had an intern work at Salem and Rockdale where there were no college advisors to meet with students and work with their um, transcripts and also push out uh, just different types of college applications. And also we had monthly meetings with college officials just to let them know about Rockdale County. Also, every month there's a newsletter that goes out with 25 to 30 scholarships for the students and families. So we did an exit, um, kind of like an exit survey of our seniors. As you can see, these are the types of seniors that participated in the scholarship. I'm sorry, in the survey. We asked them, where are you going after you graduate? So this can tell you where our students are going. And through Naviance, we were able to capture this type of data. Also with Naviance, we're able to see where our alums are going. So we can upload the information and we will have a view of where all of our students are going and we can actually track them throughout college or work. We can actually see where they are. So about 60% of our students are going to get a bachelor's degree, 8% an associate's degree. We have 7% going to employment. So you all can see the data right there. 85% of our RCPS students that responded, um, and this is just pulling out that 6.7% of students that said they were having a gap year or they didn't know where they were going. 85% um, are going directly into, into their post-secondary option, but if they don't plan to pursue any education after um, school, these were their reasons. 7% basically said that they didn't have the grades or the test scores. 20% of our of that seven of the 6.7% basically said that they have to work. They cannot go to school or they cannot um, go to trade school or anything like that. We had 35% um, said they were going into a gap year, but 7% said they have child care issues. They can't do anything basically after school. So it was great data that we were able to get from the survey. Our career choices for our students, if you dig deep and look, um, our students are really choosing careers like HVAC, welding. Most of the programs that we have at RCA, those are the careers that the children are really looking for. We um, really didn't see a lot of the professional type areas it, that you would need to go to a four-year school. We're more of our students are looking to go toward the, um, like a trade. These were the college acceptances that we saw this year. So these are the most of the schools that our students were accepted to this year. Again, our CT, these are the five types of career clusters that we noticed. 
healthcare sciences had the majority. Then there was the STEM, AV, communication, arts, film, had the next area, then business, and then architecture. These are the top five career clusters that our students are looking to go into. We also asked questions in Naviance, why did you stay at RCPS? Um, and we had a lot of interesting answers. One answer, some of the answers that pulled out to me, one was I decided to stay in, at this particular school because my mother, my father, and my brother all went here. So it was like a tradition. Um, another student said, I moved to Conyers my 11th grade year because we were told this was a good school district. I really liked open campus. These are some of the responses we received. How do you feel you've grown since ninth grade? And we see that the students felt that they matured by being in RCPS. I have better study skills. I'm more open to the idea of change. I'm more mature, more independent. So we can see how our students have matured. What did you enjoy most about your RCPS experience? And what I saw throughout all the responses is that getting closer and more relatable to my teachers, overcoming challenging courses. So students really look to have that closeness with their teachers. That was overall, that was important to them. And then were your counselors helpful? My counselors were great at holding me accountable while also supporting me. Yes, they helped me. So we saw that there definitely is a need for the school counselors. Next steps, what are our next steps? How are we gonna continue increasing um, scholarships? Well, I have a meeting with the president of Virginia Union um, and to see how we can make a connection. Also, we've already spoken with GPTC and GMC to create a program where our, st our students, if they fit within a particular criteria, there will be an automatic pathway for them to have an automatic acceptance. That meeting will take place in September. We've already done a lot of the preliminary work, but we're looking at automatic acceptances for students to go to GPTC as well as GMC. Um, we are confirming the date again with South Carolina State for that visit. Uh, we secured many scholarships and we have a group of seven that are going on scholarship there. One young lady secured the 1890 scholarship which is a federal scholarship that covers everything for four years, including a mentor. Um, she gets dorm, room and board, her tuition, a computer, everything. Totally paid for all four years. Um, yesterday I had a community resource meeting and we're gonna have more of those and more collaborations. Uh, we are also doing, again, the financial aid night with additional partners. We are encouraging students to take the SAT and ACT. We've had several, excuse me, several meetings with Derek and with Michael to make sure that we have the technology because SAT and ACT both are totally digital. Um, the high school, all high schools will attend the Infinite Scholar Fair. And we are looking at specific PL topics for counselors to ensure that they are aware of more scholarships for our students in all areas. So. Those are our next steps and resources. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, I do. I just recently um, went, uh, I was on a webinar um, and the topic was how are um, counselors being utilized in schools and what are best practices for those counselors? So I did jot down a few questions. One of them you've already answered. Um, what is the typical life day in the life of a counselor? The next one was um, asking your counselors about their caseload. Can you speak a little bit, a little bit about that? So it varies by school because of the school sizes. However, um, at one of our schools, the caseload is, I can't even speak to the freshmen because if you are ninth grade counselor, you have all of the freshman students, but on average, it can be over 650 to one. So our caseloads are astronomical. Um, they are higher than what they should be. Um, do we need more school counselors? Yes. Do we need college and career advisors? Yes. So, yeah. 
So based on that answer, as you see that there is that need, it leads me to could our numbers increase, whether it's the graduation numbers or the number of scholarships that we're yes. offering, could we increase those numbers by providing those resources for oh, you? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, and the next one you just answered too, asked if counselors need assistance with college applications, scholarships, and all those different things in the day-to-day -day operation. And the last one, how do you guys feel overall in the job? How do we feel? I mean, overwhelmed. Um, our children have trauma. Our children, um, it is different on every level. Elementary counselors are seeing something different than our middle school counselors, than our high school counselors. Our elementary children, um, we have a lot of students that elope. And so it's difficult because the elementary counselors are up and they're running behind children. Um, and they're doing a lot of small groups. Our middle school counselors are dealing with a lot of issues that our children have. Um, and so those small group issues and that they have are dealing with trauma. Um, we have a lot of suicidal ideation at the school level, um, in middle school particularly, um, friendship skills, bullying. And on that level, we must, that's when we get into a lot of bridge bill has to be done on that level. And so it's hard to do the mandated lessons like Aaron's Law, Signs of Suicide and Bridge Bill when you're dealing with everything else. And especially on the high school level, there are so many additional lessons that have to be done per state, but also trying to get the children to where we want them to be so that we can introduce them to the different types of careers and also to have the, um, in 11th grade, we need to be writing out our, our essays and getting the topics together, um, doing letters of recommendation, but when you're dealing with the other issues, it is tough. And, and are you able to meet those mandates, whether it's at the state level, federal level? I can tell you that um, I was, we were pleased with some schools and I was not pleased with others. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Cobb. Which way? Madam Chair? Yes, B. <laughs> Ms. Cobb, um, great information. Um, I just have one question. If a parent wanted to know, I was a helicopter mom. So if a parent wanted to see the list of rigor courses that their child can take, where can they find that? Is that in College Board or? Mm -mm. So the list of rigor courses are on the school website okay. as on the individual school website with the school counselor. Also, it's in um, Georgia Futures. And every child has a Georgia Futures account starting in ninth grade. Next school year, we're going to start them in the middle school having a Georgia Futures account. But in high school, every child has a Georgia Futures account and they're right there. The list of rigor courses. It's about. 11, 12 pages. Okay. But here in the district, all of our students are taking the rigor courses and we have them lined up in the academic planner. Okay. So all of our courses meet the requirements for rigor. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Jones? That the CTAE was on the rise. Yes. And I wanted to know. Um, if if there are local businesses that we have partnered with mm. so that as our in, as our high schoolers are graduating from schools they are going into internships that are leading to um, um jobs career jobs so that is dr johnson brandy johnson mm. has our work-based learning program mm -hmm. and so our students have the opportunity where they are do, um doing their internships during 11th and 12th grade year. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Dr. Williams, every year he has a program where the local businesses come over mm -hmm. and the students can actually meet with employers in the community to seek jobs once they are about to graduate. They're, they give them their resumes, meet with them and everything. So that takes place in the spring at RCA. Okay. And we also had an industry fair this year where we invited all of the local businesses to come in 
and the students were able to see the different careers, meet with um, all the businesses in the area, and that went pretty well. We had the businesses as well as um, GPTC, local colleges come in, students were able to have their resumes available, and they enjoyed it. That's good. That's good. Also with the SAT, um, do you all provide any during the day type SAT support, maybe some SAT practice session, maybe some SAT testing um, during the school day? Yes, there's actually a course called SAT prep. Mm -hmm. and um, students are able to sign up for that course. It's on the elective sheet, so when we do academic advisement, students can see that course, and they talk about it with their parents. We explain what the course is, so students are able to sign up for the course. Um, counselors, go. We, we try to go into classes in September to talk about PSAT preparation, and then in March, we go in and explain when we receive the scores back, we go and explain what your PSAT score is and we try to correlate them to how you will do on your SAT. And in high school, every student has to have a college board account. Thank you. You're welcome. And my yeah, question. I do have a, um, a follow up question on what Jenny, Janie just asked. Mm -hmm. So prior to the pandemic, the SATs were not online. No, the SATs were not online. And as you said, over the years, we've seen that they have made it optional for the students to mm -hmm. um, to take it. So we all know that when students um, succeed on tests, like the ones with um, test anxiety, that it's best to stimulate, to, um, to like put them in the environment that they're actually going to take the test. So do mm -hmm. you guys plan to have um, practice for the SAT online prior to them sitting the actual test? So actually this year um, with the PSAT, they actually had a practice day in school because this, this was the first time last school year when the PSAT was digital. So our testing district testing coordinator had a practice for the digital PSAT so that the students can get ready for the environment and actually see what it was. And the counselors also worked with the students so that they can get ready and see what it was. And it was also a prep because we worked with technology for about a year, I think it was, to actually see if we could do it. And with the SAT, we had a huge rollout um, with Derek to make sure that we were ready for it. And we still have the partnership with, not partnership, but um, we still push it towards Khan Academy and programs like that. No, so College Board no longer uses Khan Academy. And so we've informed the students of that. They actually have something called Blue Book app and technology put it, um, has it on their, what do we call it, Derek, their, dash, their dashboard. Okay. Yeah. It's actually on the student's dashboard, so they can act. I mean, they can just access it. So blue book. Blue book. That's what it's called now. I learned a lot. Thank you. You're more than welcome. <laughs> Any more questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. And thank you for your presentation. But I guess my concern is, where are we holding the parents accountable for y'all trying to teach the parents on the process of scholarships and things like that? God, I know when my children were in school, it was boots on the ground. Mm. But then I applaud you all for trying to help and make sure they get them. But I'm still like, what what is the parent role in all of it? So the district, as I stated last year, we held the first district wide scholarship financial aid night for ninth through 12th grade, and it was for the parents. And we actually, the counselors, and we had a representative for Georgia Student Finance come, and it was literally for the parents. And we walked the parents through, and it was standing room only. We had to bring in extra chairs. It was packed. So this year, we're gonna have to have it at Rockdale because that's the largest auditorium. There were no chairs left at RCA. And, the parents understood and went through everything, how to make an account, what to do, and it was by grade level. And they learned about outside sources for scholarships, as well as Georgia Student Finance, what the app was, selective service. If your child, if your son is going to be 18 and how you have to select it, we went through everything for the parents. And we're doing that again this year on September 19th. 
Oh, and we also did it virtually and we'll do it again virtually this year. Justin, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and before I get started, Ms. Cobb, did I see it's your birthday today? It is. Happy birthday and thanks for spending Thank part you. of it with us tonight. Thank you. So you had you had mentioned that on the high end, counselors have a caseload of 650 students per one counselor. Yes. What would be a manageable, a more manageable number? Because that seems astronomical. What the state requires is 450. What ASCA, our American School Counselor Association requires is 250. So is it a because we're here to help, obviously. Is it a recruitment issue or is it a budgetary issue? What is what is holding the district back from getting the requisite number of counselors in schools? Yeah, and Justin, if I might, um, of course, I've, I've said this before, I'm a former elementary middle school counselor, so this mm -hmm. is very near and dear to me. I know the impact of school counselors. Uh, the, the state, to its credit, has uh, over the last several years uh, explicitly provided for funding or gone on the record of saying we're supporting increasing funding for counselors. But of course, um, we've talked before about how that works sometimes in terms of the funds, but is it really adequate to the to get optimal uh, counselor to student ratios? Now, listen, we understand that not all students on a caseload will avail themselves of counseling services, right? There are some services that students will. When you get to advisement, which is heavy in middle and high school, that's when you're talking about everybody needs to be touched by a counselor from an advisement perspective. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about social, emotional, behavioral, uh, all of those pieces, uh, you th that's going to be by referral, right? So I just want to put that out there so that we don't, we, we, we understand a fuller context for the ratio, but understand that if you actually look at students, if you divided that up and look at the percentage of students who are requiring on a regular basis, social, emotional, behavior, all of those pieces, it's going that ratio will come will 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 come more into focus. But listen, I'm a huge supporter of getting that more optimal ratio. One to four fifty is the funding funded by the state. We know ASCA is even more ambitious, mm -hmm. but one to two fifty American School Council Association ASCA. But um, you know, I, I don't see the funding from the state aligning to the recommendation mm -hmm. from ASCA. But it still can, even if we are moving toward that aspirationally, that'll that'll be a good thing. Now, in terms of you ask about budget, Justin. Certainly, irrespective of what the state does or elects to do as a district, uh, when we are engaged in budget discussions, we can have that discussion, right? And and again, nothing is mutually exclusive, right? We're always having to say, we know we have a need for uh, speech language pathologists, these positions that are very difficult, highly specialized positions, difficult to fill. So we, it's across the board, we have some challenges there, but as a board as a governance team when we're engaging the budget process we have the ability to say this is a priority and hence we want to make sure that it is reflected in the budget uh, dr Oates, i respect that but we're getting this presentation tonight and we're potentially voting on the budget tonight so if um, ms cobb if there was one request that you as the lead counselor for Rockdale County, head of the Board of Education. You have us all on the dais, well, minus one. You have us on the dais right now. What would be that one request? That's, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, it would be a toss up between I don't know if I need more counselors or college and career advisors. But well, see in your presentation that two of two of the three high schools did not have college and career advisors at all. Correct. Was that a recruitment issue or was that a we just didn't have the funds? Before you answer that, I don't in, in, in agreement. My I wanted you to speak to this so you can answer it both for us because 
we used to use a UGA. Um, right. Yeah. So I wanted to, I was going to ask that question right before you asked. I just wanted to answer that within the framework. Well, of your I can't speak to the UGA budgetary. Okay. I can't speak to, you know, budgetary issues or, you know, funding. Well, I guess the question is, was it a position that was open that we just couldn't no, fill? No, it's the not The position open. didn't exist. It's okay. not open. Yeah, so we're talking about identifying a need that may need to be a, a new line item for funding. The other thing I'll say is, keep in mind, our, we have a process for budget requests, right? So this this is not a new process. And, and so people, we have executive cabinet members who represent departments that cover all of our departments across the school district and we have a budget committee that consists of school principals uh, as well as district office representatives and so just know that we have a structure in place for the asks to be made we certainly know we can't accommodate all asks because we have mm -hmm. finite parameters for budget but just, i just want everyone to be clear that when we say, well, we're about to vote on the budget, we have a process that's a perennial process whereby asks can be made. And that's why we have principals who are on that budget committee and they can say they, that can be asked. And then we have individual schools who are working within HR points and they can, they can say what are priorities for them. Uh, what may be a priority where counseling staffing is concerned for one school may be different at another school. So okay. I just want to make sure that we understand that the process is in place. But fundamentally, if we as a governance team say, say that there needs to be more of a look at counselors district wide, well, then we have the ability to engage that whether something comes to us through the process or not. And so that's that's the point I want okay. to make. So is that question about utilizing the students that we've been using in past years um, from UGA? Oh, who, who, who answers that question? Because they were critical when my children were in school. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, April Fallon, well, I know April, and you may know something different, uh, Tanya, but April mm -hmm. was, was the lead person for the UGA counselors, mm -hmm. and we funded that for much of my tenure. Uh, and we can look further into that, but there there have been decisions that have had to be made over the years, give in a given fiscal year based on uh, uh, revenue constraints. And I think, as I recall, and I'm going to go back to to uh, April and Zelfine, and I can follow up with the board on that in terms of specifically the UGA partnership. But I remember that that did go by the wayside. Uh, it ended a couple of of fiscal mm -hmm. years ago. But I can take a look at that. But again. You know, when you have things like increases in benefits and these type of things, it 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 puts sets into play. It sets into place prioritizations. In other words, and I've had this conversation with the board before. There's a finite amount of of resources and revenue, and we have to make the best decisions, putting students first and foremost. And um, and listen, let me be clear. And and those who have had an extended tenure on the board knows this. We've added school counselors over the last six years. Mm -hmm. So I want to be very clear about that. And we have a couple of board members whose tenure is less than a year or two. You wouldn't have firsthand knowledge of that. Uh, those who have a longer tenure know that. Go back and look at the budgets. If you, if Tanya, the, the case that we've added school counselors. We have, over the years, we have added school counselors. And this year, we did add um, a couple more on the high school side, which I'm very excited about. And I'm extremely excited about our 13% increase in scholarships from last year to this year and what we were able to do in the $37 million in scholarships that our students received. And I commend you and our counselors for that increase because that didn't happen accidentally. Thank you. When you say that, oh, I'm checking my speak. Oh, okay. When you say that, with, there's an ask, because for piggyback on what Justin said, what would her need be? But you said there's an opportunity for the principal and the people that run in the building to ask for that. So I guess my concern were the principals and the ones that make decisions out of where that you needed these additional counselors, because that was not an ask for in the budget. There were additional counselors added this year. 
No, no, I'm talking about now you're you saying that you could possibly use some more. So my thing is when we got ready for budget this year, since he said that's always a ask a request for what you need in the budget. So my question is, were they aware that there was a need for more counselors, according to your presentation tonight? The question is, I don't understand the question. The question is, um, for the principals, did they know that there's a need for more counselors in their buildings? I didn't say that. That's not what you said? That's what I said, but it wasn't my point. <laughs> yes, the and the there no. were counselors yes they saw the need and yes action. they asked and, and they yes got they got right. them let me, let me say this i know this budget that we're about to vote on tonight yes 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 yes, yes. 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 the answer is yes the because thing is we're not going to if we agree which i think we are we have consensus that there there's more counselors needed we're never going to be able to provide all of those in a single mm -hmm. so that that's clear but thank you for clarifying there have been asked yes there have been granted. asked and they have they have been granted and, and yes we have and they're they are being they're coming right right yeah but you can't you can't to get from one to 450 to one to 250 yes, to one, to 650 to one to 450 it won't happen in one fiscal year mm -mm. right but she clarified oh, that's why mm -hmm. i asked that question mm -hmm. yes great Thank it's you. It's a milestone birthday, isn't it? It is. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Ms. Cobb? Again, we want to be oh, no problem at all. because we know the struggles that our students are, whether yes, it's from okay. a social, emotional aspect or just guidance so we appreciate the work you do we appreciate the presentation and thank you for putting up with all the questions that i personally ask not a problem i appreciate the questions i'm glad that there is better understanding of what we do and i'm proud of the work that the counselors do here in the district thank you thank, thank you. you thank you Bridget. Good evening, Madam Chair Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, Dr. Oaks, and distinguished board members. I've been sitting here just listening for a minute, and as I listen, I'm trying to make connections between the work that Tanya's doing in her department with the work that we do in curriculum. So as I'm processing out loud, we restructured our ELA department, and with that, Dr. McCray will actually lead our 9 through 12 ELA um, program. We restructure her job description to work directly with scholarship writing with the high school literacy teachers. So that is support that we will provide on the curriculum side of the house. At the same time, I'm also processing as a former health and PE coordinator, mental health, emotional wellness is a part of our health and PE curriculum. So Tanya, we're going to connect again to see how we can revisit the training that our counselors might be able to provide to our health and PE teachers to assist in that specific need. So again, just brain dumping, um, but also the item that I'm going to present this evening on literacy has a direct correlation to the scholarships and the impact on career and college readiness. So I'm going to present those items to you this evening, but thank you for an opportunity to brain dump out loud as I've been processing and listening. So this evening, I'm pleased to present two action items on behalf of our literacy team. I will share that although these items will be listed as new, both of them are items that were presented for consideration before. We had Benchmark Advance in March, Windsor Learning in May, and again, we humbly appreciate your approval on all of those items. I want to remind the team that our instructional resource process started in November. This process included the vetting of resources to support all tiers of instruction. Now, as you look at this image on the screen, you see dates and a series of events. All of those dates and series of event events are important. However, there is something this image does not depict. And I'm going to um, celebrate Dr. Oaks because I've listened to him intently this year. He said throughout the year, we emphasize relationship leadership. It is important as an in, in relationship leadership is just as important as instructional leadership because it creates supportive and collaborative environment for instructional initiatives to take place. 
This is true of our instructional resource process. Throughout various departments, we have been able to thoroughly examine our needs, develop a comprehensive recommendation, and continue the diligent work of integrating a new resource. All departments, some represented in this room this evening, have played a pivotal role in ensuring a collaborative, inclusive, and effective process. This image and the, the next two slides actually is a firm example of relationship leadership. You have four teachers that were actually here at central office on, I think on Tuesday, they were back in one of the conference rooms actually working together on their science of reading modules. This is relationship leadership in action. That top picture is a yellow Mayfield truck. When that truck pulled up, I, along with the others, thought that there was an opportunity on a hot summer day for some free ice cream, but that was not the case. When we opened up the door and I talked to the delivery driver, it was in fact our benchmark resources had started arriving on our campuses. These items were brought to central office because there's construction happening at two of our sites, so they were brought here. Um, Dr. Oaks, I did not show the gentleman up on that day by rolling up my shoulders and helping, rolling up my sleeves and taking off my jacket to help take those off of the truck. However, Patty did call me from purchasing Phil, you got to make sure you tell Patty I said thank you to let me know Keith and Samuel were on the way to help take those items off of the truck and they got here in eight minutes. Through that work, again, you see those teachers opening the door, uh, helping those gentlemen, rushing them in so they could get right next to those resources. And again, you see this image, our high tower teachers, one of which was a first grade teacher, my son, celebrating having that resource. Now, this is significant for the literacy teachers for elementary because to support core instruction, they work with three specific resources. Now they have one specific comprehensive resource that they will use to support tier one instruction. And they're excited. We believe that they're going to take that excitement transfer it into the classroom and work directly with our students in practicing li great literacy skills that are aligned to the science of reading. Again, this is instructional leadership, but grounded in relationship leadership for our district. This includes support from not only curriculum, purchasing, technology, professional learning, learning support. Every single one of our departments have worked with this implementation. So I want to highlight that and again, Dr. O Oaks, that warrants applause. It has been a huge undertaking. However, understand that the work is not complete. Since approval and the adoption of the Branch Forge resource, the team has continued to work collaboratively with our learning support department. We have thoroughly examined our needs, student numbers, staffing numbers, to determine what is needed for our learning support students. Now we're ready to present our next action item. And I'm gonna pull it a little closer so I can read it. The action item reads as follows. The superintendent recommends Rockdale County Board of Education approve the purchase of additional benchmark advanced resources totaling $297,759. This purchase is contingent upon approval of contract, the contract by the superintendent and general counsel. The rationale. Back in March 2024, the Rockdale County Board of Education formally approved Benchmark Advance as a core literacy um, elementary resource and approved a six-year subscription. The pre-K through, e pre through five ELA resource adoption team previously recommended this resource to the board after vetting, reviewing stakeholder input, and comparing the instructional resources to the new state legislation, 530, House, Senate Bill 538, and House Bill 48, and the new Georgia K-12 English Language Arts Standards. The additional resource will be provided to our special education, ESOL, EIP, and classroom teachers. Again, the financial impact is 
$759. The funding source is East Plus. I will say Benchmark Advance is one of our vendors that I personally work with to um, get approval for deferred billing. So our deferred billing cycle will take place from June, uh, well, July of this year to Oct June of next year, June 2025. So we are de deferred billing for this specific resource. I will also add that we've already trained almost 200 teachers and instructional coaches, and there's required training during pre-planning and throughout the year. I specifically requested the team to work with a core group of teachers to make sure that they are immersed in this training process, to make sure that our training is sustainable past the first year of implementation. That is our dedication to the implementation of our new resource. Second item, Windsor Learning. Windsor Learning again was approved as a supplemental resource in May. Since then, the team has provided training to pre-K teachers and learning support teachers. Our elementary teachers and leaders have also received training on this resource. After meeting with the team and taking a deeper dive into the resource, we've identified a need for an additional component to support around with support around phonemic awareness. This will help the students develop decoding skills and reading proficiency. The next step of this process is directly aligned to the research presented on the, on the science of reading. I'm sorry about that. The recommendation reads as follows. The superintendent recommends Rockdale County Public School, Rockdale County Board of Education approves the purchase of Windsor Learning supplemental resource totaling 200 $1,268. The purchase is contingent upon the approval of, a con of the contract by the superintendent and general counsel. Again, in March 2024, the Rockdale County Board of Education formally adopted Windsor Learning Sunday System as a literacy supplemental intervention resource for pre-K through five. The pre-K through five ELA Resource Adoption Committee pre previously recommended this resource to the board after vetting, reviewing stakeholder input, and comparing this instructional resource to the new state legislation, House Senate Bill 538 and House Bill 48. The new Georgia K-12 English Language Arts Standards. The additional resource will be provided to our special education, SOL, EIP, and classroom teachers as needed. Again, the financial impact is $201,268. The funding source here is ESPLOS. L4GA, I'm sorry. Yes, L4GA is a funding source for this specific item. But again, I want to also, as I present this information, give a huge, huge thank you to our literacy team. They have been working full time, making sure that they coordinate directly with the vendors. Um, again, working with our technology team to make sure that we have the appropriate rollout and the technology side of the house is taking care for this implementation. Um, it has, we've also worked directly with our building leaders, listening to their specific needs, even working with building leaders on digging deep into that elementary uh, master schedule. That's something new for me as well. But again, I think it has been a huge undertaking, but definitely something that's worth it for our students and our teachers. And if you take anything away from that, go back to that image of those elementary school teachers. They wanted to unwrap those resources right there in that gym and asked to take a box home. And I said, just give me a minute, because again, we have Sharon Davison, again, a relationship leadership from RCA. She's gathered a team of media specialists that are going around to every single school to barcode these resources, to lift that off of the building leaders. So again, they will be working, they've been working on Windsor. Um, and next, I think on Monday, she and the team will start to help barcode all of our, um, benchmark resources and there are about six pallets per school and each pallet has about 15 boxes. So that's a huge undertaking for the team. So it's definitely been a team effort. So I'll open up to any questions that you may have about the process. If you have any literacy questions, I will try to answer them or I might have to phone a friend because all my literacy people are probably <laughs> home watching me online. <laughs> Sandra. Dr. Richardson, thank you so very much for your clarification about the deferment because yes, I did not want to approve because we was picking up from East Fly. So thank you for your clarification through 
your presentation this time. That way we don't have to pull it off the agenda. No problem. Thank you. Lord. And I will add, um, 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 Sandra Let Jackson, that what we did was we looked at the ask for our department and anything that exceeded $90,000, I spoke to every single vendor and requested that deferred billing. That's good. good. Madam Chair, I have a question. Um, Dr. Richards, thank you very much. What is a wealth of information. Thank you very much. So will um, teachers receive ongoing training? And then also, what is the process for monitoring the effective use of the material look like? I always say Rockdale County is rich, resource, rich, resource rich, but what could um, what to kind of hinder that us being resource rich is effectively monitoring the use of the materials. So what does that process look like? Got it. I want to make sure I answer your first question. Okay. It was the training. Yes, yeah, so they're going to so, be ongoing training. Yes, ma'am. The training actually started the day we started looking at the different resources because part of that decision was talking to the vendor about what does your training look like? Is the training going to mirror what we expect to see inside the classroom? And it has. A part of that monitoring process is myself, as well as Ms. Chess and the literacy team have been uh, involved in all of that training that has taken place. And even with the leaders, the leaders actually voiced to us that we need additional training. And because they asked for additional training, we provided that training as late as the last one was on Monday. So that training is taking place, it's continuing to take place. Even for pre-planning, what we're asking for is for each teacher at the elementary level, select at least two literacy-based courses for pre-planning, one math and one optional. This will ensure that we touch at least 425 teachers during that time. The same is true with the Windsor resource. That is a required training for pre-planning, but it just doesn't stop at pre-planning. Even with our coaches, we'll have training for the teachers throughout the year for every ILD, and there will be on-site coaching days at the school with the students and the teachers with that resource. A part of that work with leaders, the reason we want to immerse our leaders in that experience is for them to know what it looks like for that resource to be implemented in the classroom so they'll know what type of feedback to provide to those teachers right there in action. To supplement that, we're also working with our instructional coaches. We have about, if I can remember my chart in my head, about six days Four to, four to six days built in for the instructional coaches. For that instructional coach segment, we're calling it Re Literacy 120. We want to mirror with our literacy coaches at the elementary level. What does it look like to follow that benchmark process that teaching that lesson from beginning to end with teachers? We're going to do that within our coaching collab. Um, Charlene and Shanita, our literacy team, will be working with those coaches. And again, we're taking it back to the classroom working on site with those teachers. Now the monitoring happens when we're not only looking at that data for students, but also we're taking qualitative data. When we're going on our focus walks, which start as early as August, we're looking for the implementation of that resource. We acknowledge that this has been a huge investment on our district, for our district, but at the same time, we also acknowledge that no investment on student teaching and learning we can't sacrifice that. And we wanna honor, when we stand here, we wanna honor what we're asking for at the classroom level. So I hope I've answered your question, but again, we're passionate about this teaching and learning thing, uh, Ms. Jones. Yes, ma'am. Looking and analyzing the data and following the data. Right. That's what I was listening for. And I will say Benchmark as well as Windsor all have an assessment piece built in. Mm -hmm. But remember, we also have that universal screener score yes. that we've been following. Mm -hmm. So we'll be tracking that trend data to see if that influencing is that new resource or will the new resources also influence that star data? Thank you. That's good stuff. It's additional resource specific to special education, um, EIP, and what was the other one? ESOL. So is, um, is it that we didn't have that information already in the resources that we provided, or is it that we needed more to um, address these three specific areas, EIP, ESOL, and special education? I appreciate that question. 
when we initially visit the resource, we are looking at tier one, tier two, to all tiers of instruction, but we wanted to take a deeper look at the resource to make sure it's the most appropriate resource for our sensitive population, our learning support students. So we wanted to have that opportunity to work in isolation, in tandem, with the learning support team. So Ms. Germany actually joined the team. I, wa I walked down to Dr. Smith Dixon's office, looked at those numbers. We wanted to make sure that when this resource is implemented, every child had access to the resource. We didn't want to press go, and then there's a child or a classroom over here that did not have a resource. So that took additional time, and, and I'm okay with that additional time knowing that all children will have access to the resource. And I, I appreciate that you did that because that's exactly why I asked the question that it wasn't there or it wasn't fully there to meet yeah. the needs of all of the students. And you have now drilled down into it to get the resource. Or yes, yes ma'am. For that additional resources so all of our students. Yes, ma'am. Treatment. And that's why we went back to Windsor as well to identify that that decodable resource component was needed to support instruction. Perfect. Thank you. All right, any more questions? No? Thank you. Okay. Great, great presentation. All right. Jocelyn? Okay, good evening, Madam Chair Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, Superintendent Dr. Oates, remaining board members, cabinet, and community. Um, tonight, I'll bring to you the final financial report for the month of May. Revenues for May were $10.6 million. Uh, year to date was $190.8 million, representing 95.4% of the budget. Uh, last year, this time, it was 12.1 for the month and 177 year to date, representing 97.8% of the budget. Expenditures were 17.9 million and uh, Year to date, it is 191.8 million, 93% of 93.5% well, of the budget. Expenditures last year this time were 17.8 million dollars. Year to date was 172.8, representing 93.7%, and our encumbrances are 1,250,611 dollars. The fund balance for May is 35,362,341. Fund balance last year this time was 42,918,969. Our assets are at $35,362,341, no liabilities currently, and our fund balance is again 35,362,341. That concludes our financial report. Any questions? Any questions, board? Okay. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, I don't have any updates. Okay. Do anyone need a recess at this time? Good. Okay. Please review the important financial information Ms. Smith has uploaded under the section information. The board has reviewed the minutes for all board meetings held in May. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes for all board meetings held in May? So, Tether. Second, Akita Parra. Thank you, um, Ms. Duncan, and second by Ms. Palmer. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. There is no old business, but there is new business. Do I hear a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation to approve the purchase of additional? Benchmark advanced resources totaling $297,759. Second, Heather. Thank you, Ms. Jones and Ms. Duncan for your first and second motion. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. Do I hear a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation to approve the purchase? of Windsor Learning Supplemental Resources totaling $201,268. So moved, Heather. Thank you, Ms. Duncan and Ms. Jones for your first and second motion. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. 
Last week, the board voted um, to place numerous action items on a consent agenda. And the budget um, was removed. So let's see, what, what number is that, Santana? Two. Okay, so for the items one, with the exception of two, through number 16, three through 16, do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Duncan and Ms. Jones for your second, first and second motion. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. And then we will vote on the budget separately. Is that right, Santana? Yes. Can I go ahead and um, get a motion to approve uh, the action item number two, the fiscal year 25 budget adoption? Fiscal year 25 budget. I I, okay. All right. A motion has been made by Ms. Duncan, second by Ms. Palmer to adopt the fiscal year 25 budget. Uh, is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Motion. Two, three. There's a tie, so it does not. It passed. With the 3 3 tie? Yeah. Well, it has the. There's no majority. But well, the process previously, there was a tie. Mm -hmm. How? Let me. I'll check the rules. Can you but, check it, please? Yeah, I, I will check it. But let's. The, you want us to take a moment or you want us to yeah, come back to it? Yeah. Okay, let's take a recess and let's just check to see what the um, outcome should be. So please take about a five minute recess. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman. Okay, we haven't we haven't come come back from the recess yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, we'll, we'll move forward then. All right, so um, since we don't have a majority, we are going to have to call, uh, have a call meeting for the budget. And so, um, Ingrid, we will have a date um, before, we need that date before July the 1st, um, within hopefully the next couple of days, if you wouldn't mind. Go ahead and get it scheduled within the next few days. Um, and we will come back and see if we can get a vote. Madam Chair, okay. if I might, if I might. Um, as superintendent of schools, I serve in many different capacities. Chief executive officer is one of those capacities. Another capacity is as treasurer to the board. And um, I have uh, been very clear uh, in the past, uh, after last year's budget, as an example, to communicate to our board the implications for not approving our budget. And I only offer that because I think it's important for the public to know our process. I talked about our budget development process earlier. Um, and it's important for us to understand that the process is built and designed to afford governance team members as far as as well as the public through the budget hearing to share their views about the budget. Um, for me, uh, it's very troubling that the budget did not pass tonight. That's the prerogative of each board member to vote their conscience. But I think it ironic that after a fairly extensive discussion on additional asks and school counselors and their additional counselor positions that are that are hanging in the balance in not passing the budget tonight, I find that very ironic and perplexing, quite honestly. And um, when in the absence of any uh, definitive questions, when we solicit questions during the budget process that could that we could possibly resolve so that we avoid I don't let me let me just say this. No one should believe that it's a tenable solution to go with continuing resolutions and budgets. That's not the way that this was designed to work. And that's why we put a lot of effort into the budget development process to include my calling for a third finance committee meeting, which is also a public meeting, by the way, that all public is, is, is able to come to because we publish that meeting just like we do our regular board meetings. And uh, so with that, as superintendent and chief executive officer and secretary and treasurer to the board and secretary to the board, I have the 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 privilege and the right to share publicly my disappointment in the failure to pass our FY25 budget tonight. Now I'll yield back to the chairwoman. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Yeah, Madam, Madam Chair, I do. Um, I attended every last one of the budget hearings and I did not hear any issues that came out of those meetings. So I would like to ask for the votes of no, what are the issues? We can't work toward res resolving those without knowing what they are. So if I if if I don't know if that's appropriate here or do we have to talk about that later? Okay. I don't mind um, beginning. I remember at the last budget meeting or um, at our last meeting, one of the things that Justin asked was that we have an audit um, of our finances. And um, of course we were outvoted, but I think that audit is necessary. I also believe that we should have a process in place if it's not yearly maybe it's every two years where we are evaluating our non-home positions to see if those positions can be collapsed or combined that's i mean that's my reasoning and those issues were brought up during the budget committee meetings and I know, but we are losing, we're hemorrhaging students in Rockville County Public Schools, and yet our budget continues to increase and increase and increase. And I understand that there, there are increases in the health insurance. We ate that in the budget last year. There's TRS increases. We, you know, we were having to eat that in the budget, but there doesn't seem to be any offsets that, you know, I'm a firm believer that our county office, we need to look at consolidating some positions and opening up money from our from our um, expenditures because we cannot continue to tap our 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 taxpayers to death 
look at the Rockdale Citizen, look at the legal ads, and I want you to see the number of foreclosures that are taking place because people cannot afford to pay these taxes. So it, it, y'all can you can be disappointed. I get it, but I'd urge the superintendent and his administration to go back to the drawing board and it, at the very least cut us from having to dive into our reserve funds. I mean, that's that's three million. Give us some report on the necessity of the positions at county office. These these high paying positions that we hear time and time again from individuals in the school system that, you know, somebody making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year shows up in Zoom meetings or, you know, we can't make contact with individuals in HR that these are high paying positions that that are occupied by people that won't answer a phone. We received an email from a, you know, a, a disgruntled employee that was simply trying to get verification of employment to go to another to another school, to another district. And it took phone call after phone call after phone call for that to take place in an office that's a substantial part of county office's budget. So you wanted my reason, those are my reasons. Thank you, Jackson. Oh, okay. Okay, and, and Dr. Oz, I have, I'm sorry, I have one last question. Dr. Oz, I know you mentioned those impl implications and I cannot remember them. So can you please tell us what they are again and not, and what, what is the timeline we have to have our budget to Georgia DOE? Yeah, well, that timeline is obviously at the end of the fiscal year by the beginning of the next fiscal year. And we know the new fiscal year begins July 1st. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate the board members sharing their views, but um, this is not information that in all of the successive weeks that we had gone through the budget that was shared directly with me as, as, a, as a concern that would cause the budget to be held up, right? There was supermajority support for the tentative budget, and there's only been one change since the tentative budget to the final okay. budget, and that was... And that was because of the state revising its QBE funding for us that ended up uh, subtracting $720,000 from the original amount. And that just increased the the, uh, the amount that we would tap the reserves to $3.7 million. That's the only change between the tentative budget and the final budget. But I didn't hear anything about the audit being a concern when the tentative budget was passed. And we're going to have an audit in maybe at the end of this fiscal year, which will be in a few days. We're going to prepare for the audit, which will actually take place in the fall. So that I'm puzzled at that. We we would pay for an audit when we're going to have an audit at the end of this fiscal year, which will this the fiscal year ends on June 30th. Um, so in any event, Madam Chairwoman. I think we understand that we won't be able to proceed. So for the um, community, we need to talk about when Rockdale County not passing their budget, school budget, fiscal year budget, what does that mean? So I do know that was included the budget um, salaries for teachers, resources for students, can you talk about those things, Dr. Oates? Yes, yes. In fact, I say it's ironic that we had the protracted conversation about school counselors. We we confirmed that there were requests for additional school counselors that were granted, and they're in the budget. I'm, I feel like I, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone, quite honestly. Yeah. But in any event, yes, yes. Not not the 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 step increases that. We committed to all of our staff, not going to happen without a budget being approved. The raise that the governor provided for all staff that we passed on, not only to the staff that the state provided funds to cover, but as you know, the state never provides enough funding to cover all certified personnel. We have those additional staff that we're going to cover because we don't believe in picking winners and losers in that regard. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen without a budget. Everything that board members said was important to them and we need to look at with respect to counselors. We have schools that requested additional counselors and got them. They're not going to get them after tonight's action. So that that's needs to be, I'm just think we need to be very transparent and clear with the public uh, in, in that regard. And I hear the concerns, but we were very clear uh, on the constraints that are beyond our control with respect to increasing benefits costs, increased retirement 
contribution costs. Um, and, and there was a slide, an entire slide that our distinguished CFO shared that showed all of the all of the unfunded mandates, right? Uh, CFO uh, Joyce, you you shared all the unfunded mandates that we that we have to take on as a district. So again, I will be convening an emergency meeting with our CFO and our HR chief and my executive cabinet to look into this because we've never been here before. Wow. We've I never been here before in my tenure. In six, I've started my seventh year superintendent, completed six. I've never missed a single board meeting or called or regular, and we've never had this to happen. And I think it's a very, very unfortunate precedent that has been set here tonight. Andrew, you, you want to speak? No, okay. So, um, if, if Sandra is not speaking, I okay. Do All right, go ahead. Oh. I um I I would like to ask a question. Can I ask it directly of the persons who so if we are able to agree to an audit um host the audit being prepared next month, next week, the 31st is a week and a half away. What well, takes time? So is that is that a is that can we move forward with the budget if we can agree to do an audit and another audit? What would that do? Janie Jade, I took the notes. Janie said that one of hers was audit and the process of collapse in different positions. So my two questions are going to be about the audit and what positions are we collapsing in order for this budget to pass? Because the implications are greater than an audit that is forthcoming. And what are the positions? Because it's always great that we want to collapse positions, but what are those positions that we're going to be collapsing? And of course, you I'll begin. to answer that question as well. Yes, I'll begin. So that is the purpose of the audit. When you bring in an outside company, they will perform that audit and they are they will provide that information as to what positions can be eliminated and what positions can be co co combined. That's the purpose of the audit. It's not. No, no it is. No. So let me tell you, so um, Heather, thank you for laughing, but I do know what I'm talking about. When you bring, yes, but when you have an audit about the positions that a county or district has, that is the purpose of them. Oh, so I've done that research prior to bringing it to the board's attention. So okay. I think you're talking about a different audit. You're not May, talking maybe about we are. We talk yeah, about, yeah, yeah, we maybe we are. Yeah, you're talking about yeah, 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 that's the difference. Yeah. So, you started just you cited Justin raising so, the audit. No, he I wasn't talking about I talk about two audits, Dr. O. And uh, I don't know why um, you all have amnesia, but in the meeting I did share with you all that I think that we should, as a district, have a process in place for every two years where we are evaluating our non-classroom positions to see, do we still need those positions? Can those positions be combined or can those duties and responsibilities be combined? Oh, I very much remember that. Discussion. And then and also, I'm going to come back. I agree with Justin that since we have a new CFO, we should have had an audit. We should have had some type of audit to ensure that there were no discrepancies in any area with our finances. We addressed the issue. I, I addressed very in great detail why I felt that it was not prudent to have an audit. It would have been about $50,000 when we had our, the audit presented on in February. I shared the results of that audit. Um, and and I shared all of the layers, the multiple layers of audit. The state actually does a review of our uh, Malden and Jenkins audit every year. So that would have, ironically enough, that would have been an additional cost well, of $50,000 when we were just months away from our annual, normal annual audit processes. And we did address your your concerns um, in terms of you're talking about the positional audit. And we say, essentially, we have that built into HR where we review every vacancy that occurs at the district office level to see if that's something that we wish to, f to fill. And then I shared with one example was uh, Karen Reynolds retired and, and Tammy Styles is but retired. But I ask. If, if, if I may, if I may finish. You, you uh, may. Those, those are two, those are two administrative assistants, one for finance, one for teaching and learning, 
but we were able to have a conversation about that and there will be one uh, administrative assistant who will serve both of those departments. Now that's one example, but what we said is certainly we can look at a formalized audit uh, in terms of looking at positions and we can do that. Well, Shanita Russell presented from this podium on our literacy. She's our coordinator for literacy, but she also shared with you that she's also over EIP for the district and trains our EIP teachers and do all of that. And I shared, we have many people who have a position and they're doing numerous uh, functions. And I said that in other districts, even adjacent districts, though that would be multiple people. So we're already doing what is being asked for. I think maybe there's a real opportunity to further educate our board on the, the amount of work that individuals are doing that have a particular titular title, but they're actually doing multi-departmental work. And that's just a reality. And, and, and Shanita is not unique among Rockdale County Public Schools district office professionals. District office people have been cast as almost the boogeyman, right? These are people, over 95% of these people or more started out in the classroom. They're not non-educators. It's just that over the course of their career, they have the opportunity to progress vertical mobility and put their skills to use in supporting, right? There are two types of people in any school district, those who teach and those who support teachers. And you have to have both for the system to be successful ultimately. And um, so that, that's all I'll say. So I have a question. So I, I, um, I, 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 I got that everybody jumped into this one, but I asked two specific questions and I want to just make sure that I got the answer. So the audit that you were speaking of is not a financial audit or it is a financial audit, but it's in addition to a, the, the process of collapsing different positions. So it wasn't two points that you were making. It was one point that falls under the audit. You said two things. You said audit and the process of collapsing positions. So and I want to go back to what Dr. O said. Dr. O, don't forget, I am an educator. So I understand um, the roles and responsibilities that one individual can have. I understand that I, I am an educator 26 years. So for you to say that we need to educate the board, I find it to be an insult. That comment shouldn't have been made. I find it to be insulting. I'm, I'm, I'm making the point that I'm not the one that's been casting people at the district office as being and unnecessary then, and excessive. No one has said that. Yes. That's what an audit would determine. No one is saying that the people at the district office are, are um, unnecessary. We're saying if you do an audit, that's what the audit would, that's the information the audit would provide us. I've already said to you that we have processes in place that achieve that and we're fine to look at a formal uh, bid With an outside company. Someone. Right, exactly. We, and we had that conversation as of uh, the carry out from the finance committee meeting. We talked about that. So we, the, we can do that. So the outside person would be for um, the the, the, position. Personnel, the, per, the positional audit, um, not the financial audit. Whatever okay. the board would agree is best. That's my response. I, I, I'm, I'm asking for clarification because the, the idea is that the financial audit is already done by an outsider. So I'm asking, are we going to have two outsiders come in to do for the personnel and one for the financial? Because the financial auditor is already an outsider. So that's why I'm asking for and clarification. And is that not the same company that we've used for years? So you're saying that we want to use a different company. Why not? We have a new CFO. Why not? The standards for accounting are the same, irrespective of the company. And this is a company that you heard how many districts they do. They do most of the districts. And, and so I don't, so if every time there's a new CFO, we should have a, an, an, a superfluous audit, despite the fact that we have an annual auditing process that's reviewed by the Georgia Department of Education's audit division, and then we have a separate audit for our East Bloss funding annually. And uh, also, Madam CFO, we had a recent random cross-functional audit. And what were their findings? Right. Yeah, yeah. And so the point is there's a lot of oversight, auditing oversight to look at these things. And, and I think there's not a lack of audit layers already in place. I just I just think 
that if you're making the case for being fiscally responsible at calling for an audit a few days before the end of the current fiscal year, which will trigger our annual audit in the fall, just seems to be um, unnecessary. But I at least I understand what the ask is. So. But in about when people leave, we're not replacing them. But I think my big concern is just the warrants is there. Can we not look at what we have there? And I know you're good at telling us that your discretion and what you have. But my concern is I know when the people are leaving, we may not be replacing them, but we still have some position that maybe we could look at just like this. Uh, Stowers and all there was a system. Do someone else have a system that we could perhaps do away with it to decrease our budget? So you want us to lay off? Hmm? Are you asking for a layoff? I'm not saying looking at positions put, to put them in the schools and allow them to assist the counselors with uh with some social emotional learning or whatever we can do with them. I'm not saying I don't want anyone to lose their job, but I just said we need to look at because like I said, he's good to say that we're not replacing. But what about some? So I, what I said is that we we review every vacancy every to vacancy. determine whether or not it's necessary to replace that. And I gave you a specific example in which we did not replace an administrative assistant, but we are, we're going to have one administrative assistant serve two departments, teaching and learning, and um, as well as finance. And and also too, I just wanted to mention that um, in my training, board member training. Um, the decision on what resources, what staffing needs to take place doesn't come from the board. Um, and so in the budget process, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that every um, chief works with every department director um, and assistant superintendents all the way down to the principals to work with their staffing to see what they need to make sure that we are um, fully staffed appropriately and that we have the resources that we need. Um, I just want to make sure that I understand, um, especially what Janie is saying about collapsing positions. Um, what does that look like um, when we collapse a position and if we collapse a position and an individual, how do we, I mean, we don't get to determine what we're going to do with that person. That is determined by maybe the principal, if it's in the school, but I think she was talking more of the district office. So that will come from directors and the chiefs. So, we don't get to determine, and I thought during the process of our budget planning, I thought that was already done, Dr. O. So if you wouldn't um, mind sharing your process when you're creating a budget, are you all not looking at um, what we have and Absolutely. are we adjusting? How, how do you all come with the budget? Because I'm, I'm really confused because based on what J Janie is saying and what Sandra and are saying, it sounds like they don't think that's happening. Well, listen, the, every time we begin the budget process, that process initiates with me and the executive cabinet. Who are the executive cabinet? They're the chiefs who are the top line supervisor of all of our district's departments, teaching and learning, finance, technology, student support services, uh, operations, um, human resources, right? Um, uh, with Cindy, that would include uh, uh, communications and, and, and strategy and innovation. And so these individuals, the charge is the same to them every year. Look at your people and understand that we always want to be fiscally responsible with our budget. They know that's what I always look at. If there can be some cuts made, let's offer them up, right? Give me the rationale for why you can't, you don't believe that you can cut, make any cuts and still be able to sustain the essential functions of your department. That's 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 part of the process. That's not a you're not asking me to do something I don't do already. What I hear is that you believe that there could be additional cuts and that there should be fewer district office people. I do keep up with the rhetoric, right? And so the point I'm making is is we have this built into the process. You can disagree with the end result of what we're asking for. And you could even vote against the budget passing because you feel strongly about that. 
but don't say that we're not doing that. We are looking at that all the time. I don't want any department to just be sitting on superfluous or unnecessary staff. And we engage that process every year. There And listen, I'm not going to name anyone in particular because I like chiefs to advocate for their departments, even if it means asking for additional personnel. But I have had some chiefs come up to me and say, can we add back some of what we what we took away? And, I, and my answer was no. I said, I don't want there to be any add backs or any adjustments to the RIF uh, staffing decisions that were made last budget development process that is reflected in the current budget. And those are things that are conversations that happen behind the scenes with me, with the, the department and the chief. But I do think it's important to say that now, if there's a view that we're not having those conversations about, no, we're going we're gonna to sustain the previous cuts that we made. And can you identify positions in your department? And there have been chiefs who, many of them, who have done that. I think of Phil in operations. He'll offer up, you know, he, when, when, he, when he knows that we're dealing with increased uh, increased uh, cost of benefits and increased retirement, um, and, and we want to make sure that everybody gets the benefit of the, all certified personnel gets the benefit of a raise that the governor's providing, but, but that he isn't providing for all certified personnel in the district. Then people come forth and say, well, we, let me look here and see. And when you heard me saying we kept directing the departments at the, at the executive cabinet level to go back and make cuts to their budget requests, they're, they're doing that, right? They're doing the work and they can tell me at the end of the process what they did, but more important than telling me what they did, I want to know, did you uh, find some additional cost savings by trimming your departmental budget? I don't need to know all the details of the who and what, but did you do that? If that's the directive, that has been the directive for many of the six years that I've served as superintendent. We've had challenges of revenue because of increased budget, you know, increased uh, benefits costs, increased contributions to TRS. So uh, I, I I would not be a pretty a good boss or a good supervisor if I didn't offer to defend that. No, the, the chiefs are making cuts. They are, they've done that on multiple cycles for multiple fiscal year budgets. And, um, and if you're saying that I don't believe that a budget should ever increase from one year to the next, I, that's just not sustainable or, or realistic, just if you're looking at the cost of services alone, in part related to inflation, right? And previously related to, to supply chain. So, yeah, it's almost like yeah, I feel like a no win situation because we try to make sure we contain the 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 rate of increase of, of fiscal year budgets from year to year. But I don't know of a district that produced a budget this less than the previous year because costs are not being less, right? So then we're saying how can we be very responsible with the revenue that we have, right? So, um, yeah. So, you know, you mentioned the, the, the tapping the, the fund balance. You saw that there's $35 million in fund balance. So we'll see where we fall because we'll look at that fund balance at the end of the fiscal year, which is in a few more days. But the reality is when I came as superintendent, it was $1.8 million in fund balance. There was nothing to tap, right? I think we've done something right in six years that we have $35 million, and we, listen, we're stingy about it. We don't want to touch any of it, but that's why a fund balance exists so that you can, you, can, you can have some latitude to make decisions to find revenue as opposed to, say, increasing a millage rate, right, or getting into the bonds business, right? So that, that's what I would offer, Madam Chair. Not finished. Okay, right. go ahead. Okay, so um, Janie um, kind of got me clear on where she is and Justin Sandra chose not to speak um, because you're, you're on the same space, right? But you also mentioned the word and I'm very um, wordsmithy, um, em hemorrhaging of students. Expound on that, please. Mm. The school district is hemorrhaging students. Take it from there. We're down mm. 15,000 students from 17,000 over the course of two years. I mean, Again, I'm not going to get into semantics. If you don't think it's hemorrhaging, that's fine, but there's a significant decrease in the number number of students that we have. So it's not our semantics. It's how I actually to expound on it. That's it. 
I just did. Okay, awesome. Um, so what were you saying about the TRS aspect of it? You you said three things and I didn't get the whole thing. When I'm telling that, I'm literally just asking you to say what you're saying. I didn't Sure, I, I said I understand that there are going to be additional budgetary uh, expenditures that we have because of the additional health insurance premiums and TRS or two that I mentioned and folding back in the um, the custodial staff. So I don't want anybody to on this day is to think I'm ignorant of the fact that we have had additional expenditures. But to expound upon what I previously said and, to, and to, to, I guess, to ask a question of Dr. Oates, um, you know, you said you would listen to the rhetoric. I have made many public statements in my campaign about issues that I've had, but there has been, uh, and the way I feel is that when, if we raise these issues, they're not strongly considered because there was a 4-3 minority on the board. We just happen to be in a position tonight where there is, we have one member missing and it is forcing a conversation, an earnest conversation for with folks to actually listen. So when I mention that there are positions in, in HR that need to be looked at, that there are positions at county office that need to be looked at, the rhetoric isn't something that I just made up, Dr. Oates. I've lived in this county for a long time. I know a lot of teachers. I know a lot of administrators. I know a lot of people in this county. Sir, the call is coming from inside the house. It is not something that I've made up. That folks cannot, our teachers cannot call HR and not get a, re a return phone call. They cannot send emails and not get a return email. If they have an HR issue, they should be able to show up to HR and be seen immediately. If that's not possible, then at least have appointments that uh, they will actually be seen. We need to have HR in office, not working from home. If we are making a proposal to have classified uh, employees, uh, particularly our paraprofessionals, be outsourced and onboarding and that whole process be taken care of by an outside entity, there's been no mention of consolidating the director and assistant director of HR. And oh, by the way, they need a chief as well. And I know we just voted on that, but how is it that we need a director that handles certified, a an assistant director that handles classified, that encompasses all of our employees. And then we got to give them a chief on top of that. By the by, we're talking about outsourcing a vast majority of our of our classified employees. So we're talking out of both sides of our mouth that we have to continue to increase the budget and increase the budget and increase the budget. And to do so, we have to tax our residents to oblivion. I want you, I, I'm earnest when I say this, I want you to look at the number of tax foreclosures, that the number of houses that can be sold on the courthouse steps as a result of people not being able to pay the taxes that we're imposing on them. I get that we have to fund a budget, but we work for taxpayers. You work for us and the people that you recommend to us work for you. I understand the structure, but if I'm going to raise my hand to a massive budget, I have to be able to make sure that the folks who voted me into this office are able to pay them. And sir, they're struggling right now. You, you've made a very good speech on that, but um, is it not a leap for you to now just say that the reason why people are losing their homes is because they can't pay taxes, that that's why their homes are being um, um, auctioned off on the courthouse? If, is that not a, no, I'm asking, is that not a leap? Is that going to be the only factor that lead people to why their homes are now on top of the, um, are being auctioned off? If there's a tax bill, yes, I believe that's the fundamental reason why they're being sold. And if you look at your tax bill, we, the folk, it, they're, I have too, and about had a stroke. And the, the school board doesn't get the benefit of host tax. I mean, every dime that we tax the citizens, there are no rebates, no refund. There's, aside from the exemptions, there is no sales tax that gets credited toward it. So every time, you know, our, we increase taxes 20%, that is 20% more that's coming out of our constituents' pockets. And we have to earnestly take that into consideration. I think as a board, we have not. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm throwing it that out there for all of our, our board members, right? So even um, if you don't mind me calling you out, not mm -hmm. in a negative way, but we we're talking last week about, you know, the fact that DeKalb County, um, DeKalb County has increased their minimum pay to 62.5 for, for teachers and our minimum pay is 
50,000 roughly. And so our neighbors are paying our teachers $11,000 difference as their starting pay. Right. And the comment made is, um, well, maybe we should just increase. And it was said in a facetious way, so I'm not doing it in a mm. holding anybody's feet to the fire. But maybe we should just increase their pay. How do we pay teachers more? Um, lower classroom size, fire half of central office, not provide the support we need where we just heard a counselor stand in front of the microphone and say we have 650 of up to 650 per True. students want. How do we maintain all of that if all we're being asked to do is lower the taxes, give senior citizens more tax exemption, who advocates for children besides the people that are sitting on this board who were voted in to advocate for students because so far we are not advocating for students is all we're asking for is for the benefit of everybody else that mm -hmm. teachers get it that parents get it that grandparents get it who advocates for the people that is between the age of four years old and 17 years old when they get out of our school system and that's not a question i'm asking anyone to answer i'm asking you as you make these decisions that you start thinking about who we are here to represent yes we have to add we have to get the parents and the community people to vote for us but we are here to make decisions that are in the best interest of students and not passing a budget not passing a budget is a big deal it is a big and it is a critical deal. If we now say that we agree with Janie Jones and say, OK, we are going to get an outside auditor. Will that still allow you to? That's going to be six months to 12 months to get a new company hired. I'm not even talking about the $50,000 that we're paying for it. It's the fact that we now have to research to find another outside company, right? That's going to take time. Do we sit back on our hands and decide that we're not passing the budget because we want an outside auditor? Do we sit back and say that we have to question the superintendent and his cabinet members to the extreme degree because we have no confidence in the decisions of the people that we hire? Therefore, we are not going to pass a budget until we fire or we let go positions or we reposition or we reprocess or we collapse. Whatever verbiage you want to use or we're hemorrhaging that we are not going to do anything about passing a budget because we cannot learn our positions and advocate on the behalf of students because we're not. And our position say that we're overseeing the annual budget preparation. We didn't prepare the budget. The budget was handed to us. But we never prepare it. It's not, but, your, but, it's not your role. Uh, but it, they're overseeing the annual budget preparation and the resources deployment. Mm -hmm. Overseeing. Time to oversee this budget. And then we come on the stage and grandstand like we've never seen the budget before. I took the first budget, the first year I came on this board, I sat on the budget committee and I took that binder home with me under Keith and Leeds leadership. And I went over that budget line by line by line with a red ink. And when I sat in that room, I then asked all the questions I had. I learned what I learned. Here's the key word because we are educated. We are in this educational space. I asked all the essential questions and I challenged them to go back and redo the budget line items that I disagreed with. And guess what? They did it. But we never came up on the dais and grandstand because we had six weeks to go over it before we got to the stage. Because if you're talking to them hard enough and if you're listening to them hard enough and you're posing the right questions, they will do as you're asked because guess what? We are where the buck stops. I'm going to excuse myself. Excuse that. And so I would like to add that these were the same concerns that were brought up at the budget committee meetings. I don't think Ms. Duncan was present at those meetings when we brought those concerns up, but these are the same concerns that were brought up and you were not there. OK, so. And so I guess I guess if you all had it in a, a majority with Miss North, we would never be having this conversation. I guess that's what it is because those these concerns were brought up. Into, in my opinion, I'm going to be open and honest. They were blown off. That's that's the way I went and feeling like 
my concern was heard, but it wasn't heard. Like it was blown off. And so there you have it. If Miss North was here, we would not be having this conversation. That's what I heard just now. And I don't. I don't think. And I'm going to turn my mic off. Yeah, I don't think. I'm going to turn my mic off because I think here. I'm going to stop myself, but I'm going to turn my mic off because I think what just happened just now is a travesty. Number one, like I said, you weren't even present at the last committee, the budget committee meetings. And then you came and you grandstand. We have Madam Chair ask us how we felt. And I don't think that anyone needs to be grilled about their opinion um, to, to satisfy what you're asking. And that's the way that I took it. So guess what? I'm going to turn my mic off. And the report back to me. And therefore, there was no surprise. I didn't make an effort. There were days when I got here on time to make it to the budget committee meeting, but I had already decided that I would review it. I would ask the questions I had, which I did, but I would not be physically present. So it's not that I didn't review the budget. It's not that I didn't ask the questions I had for the budget. I just told them that ahead of time that I would not be present by choice. For those and, and let me just um let me just clarify okay so for our budget um committee meeting um it is not required for the um entire board to be there um it is just open you know for board members to come and of course they get their book and they're looking through it and mm -hmm. if they have questions of course other um, committee meetings are held and of course a lot of times what's happening and I, Dr. Oates can, you know, confirm that usually if I have some questions, he knows that I'm going to go line by, Heather and I, we both do line by line because we do want to see, um, and, and I keep my book from the previous year as well, and I kind of see where we have made those changes, where we have um, made some savings, but I don't, I don't, I don't, when I come, I've already done my work. I don't do my work on the day. As I do the work, I prepare for, for the meetings before I get here, in addition to the financial um, budget meetings as well. But, but, but I get what you're saying and your questions and your concerns that you may have. But at this point, here, here's what, what I, the question that I have. Are you saying that you you do not want to approve this budget if we first of all we can do an audit understand we're already starting to prepare for an audit in a few more days an audit you don't say you're going to have an audit today and it starts tomorrow or two weeks from now it takes time we don't have that kind of time in you know to start a budget if we don't approve a budget then we're going to have more concerns um, however, um, I would recommend that board members take some time and then we have a call meeting. If you have some questions or concerns, I suggest you contact Dr. Oates so he can schedule some small group meetings so you all can sit down and talk about what positions you want to get rid of or collapse, how that looks for you. But understand that it's not the board member's responsibility. That is the um, um, administrator's positions. That's their job. And what, whether we agree with them or not about any changes, about any collapses, about any positions that they present in their budget, it is not up to us to say they don't need it. And, and so we can talk about those things. We can share with them our perspective. But we don't make that decision on what their day to day operation would look like as it relates to staffing and um, resources for students. So I'm going to ask the board members to really um, those who have those concerns. I respect what you're saying and I see that you need more time 
And um, I suggest within the next few days you do that um, so that we can come back to the table and approve our budget. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to close further discussion. All right, a motion has been made to close this discussion. All in favor? Motion carries. Okay, at this time we do have, um, do I hear a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel? So moved, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Heather, for your first mm -hmm. and second. A motion has been made. Second, to go into executive session. It is now 8.54. Um, we have. Yeah. Ingrid. Ingrid. I can't. Oh, we're going to be there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can't yeah. tell you. That's fine. Uh -huh. This meeting would have to be after Wednesday because I have surgery Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. 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 Oh, I see what you're saying. Just do both of them. Yeah, just Start. excuse us. Yeah, to come out. Okay. Can we do that? Let's do that. Yeah. So that we, we already come back. Yeah. Oh, I should just think the walking back and forth. But we already approved the agenda. Uh, we already approved the agenda. But we can't we can't take any action until so we hear back on things. And last week, Esther reached out to them. And I said, oh, no, Bernie just called me. Where is it? What's going on? They have responded. So,
Let's have a night. Yeah, Stop. I don't need you to do that. We're not doing that. We are not doing that. Stop. Nine thirteen p.m. and the board has come back into open session. Do I hear a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation to appoint Fanata Gooden, so currently assistant principal at General Ray Davis Middle School, to principal at Conyers Middle School, effective July the first, twenty twenty-four? So moved, Heather. Thank you, Ms. Duncan, and thank you, Ms. Jones, for your first and second motion to approve Ms. Gooden as assistant principal for general, a uh, principal at Conyers Middle School. Sorry about that, Ms. Gooden, I'm sure you're watching. All in favor? Motion carries. Do I hear a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel? Thank you, Ms. Duncan, and thank you, Ms. Palmer, for your first and second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. 914.
the time is now 931 and the board is back into open session. With no further business to discuss, do I hear a motion to conclude the meeting? So moved, Justin. Thank, Thank you, you, Justin. Thank you, Ms. Jones. For your motion to conclude the meeting, all in favor? Motion carries 932.